And I just want to thank God for all our visitors this morning. If you're a visitor online or here in this church this morning, we're so grateful and thankful that you came. We also want to pray this morning for those in our congregation that we know that are traveling, Don and Cynthia that are gone, Peter and Heather and the boys that are gone, Scott and Judy that are gone, Greg and Sarah that are gone. We, we have so many people that are traveling, that are on the road, that are not here this morning. We want them to know if they're online, Matt, who's in Jerusalem, that our prayers are with them. And this morning, I am just so thankful and so grateful for all of your prayers last week, especially for Miriam. Where's Miriam? Miriam back there that you prayed for last week. Miriam is so brave. She's here in the congregation this morning. Miriam, you're amazing. For Cindy Williams, who's here with us this morning, please pray for Earl. Earl has been released from the hospital, needs ongoing prayers. But Earl's at a soccer game with his son this morning. Hallelujah, and thank you, Jesus, for that. Continue to strengthen that man of God in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Father, we pray as a congregation in one accord this morning. Father, that all sickness, that all disease, that all cancer is driven out of his body in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And that he begins to experience the healing power and virtue of God, restoring his body and strengthening it and energizing it in Jesus' name. Amen. I just pray that a spirit of prayer descends upon this congregation. We are a praying people. Amen. And we're going to see God moving in miraculous ways. I really and truly believe it. So I just wanted to remind you quickly this morning, don't forget Rooted on a Sunday morning at, uh, I think it is 9.15 in the wind modular. Ty, stand up back there, Ty. If you haven't joined Rooted yet, I want you to join Ty for Rooted. There's still books at the back there that you can purchase and you can join this amazing study uh, at 9.15 here on a Sunday morning. It is a journey that you're going to undertake, and it is really powerful. Also, on a Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock, also in the wind modular there, you can join. And you can also join via Zoom if you can't actually get here to the, um, to the facility. So please feel free, go on our website. The link is posted. You can join via Zoom. Our youth next week as well will be starting the same series with Alejandro, who will be back. So I, I'm just thrilled for that. And of course, when, stand up, when, we'll be also doing Rooted in Mandarin. So there's so many opportunities for you to get involved in this amazing study, which is going to be really your journey as a Christian and your story as a Christian and how you can use your story and tell others about your story as a way of explaining to them what Jesus Christ has done for you and meant to you. And this morning, I just want to read a scripture here concerning the tithes and the offerings. You know, I do not generally labor this at all in this congregation, but I just think that it's so important to us to recognize how important it is for us to continue to be faithful to God in all things. And one of those things is in our tithes and our offerings. In verse 6 of 2 Corinthians chapter 9, it says, remember this, remember this. It's a call for us not to forget. He who sows sparingly and grudgingly will also reap sparingly and grudgingly. He who sows generously will also reap generously and with blessings. Let each one of us give as he has made up his mind and purpose in his heart, not reluctantly, not sorrowfully, or under compulsion. There is no compulsion to give here this morning. For God loves and God prizes. God takes pleasure and God is unwilling to abandon or do without a cheerful, joyful giver whose heart is in their giving. And notice what God says here as he encourages the congregation. And God is able to make all grace, every favor and earthly blessing come to you in abundance 
so that you may always and under all circumstances and whatever the need, be self-sufficient. Don't you love this? In all circumstances, God says, He is taking care of you. He's upholding you. He never lets go of you. And under all circumstances, He will support you. And I believe God has something else He wants to tell us this morning. So Kelly, you go ahead. You go ahead before my joke this morning. Okay. God gave me this scripture during worship, and I think it's for everybody. I'm coming to show you now. This is John 17, 13 and on. I'm coming to show you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world. This is Jesus talking. So that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. <clears throat> I have given them your word, and the world has hated them. For they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. Sorry, I'm a little nervous. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is the truth. And you sent me into the world. I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that you too may be truly sanctified. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus, for the unity of the Spirit, Lord God Almighty. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Well, this morning I'm sure you're excited to hear from Peter. I know that he's going to cut his sermon in half this morning. <laughs> well, you know, that's all, always my prayer. I think one Sunday it's going to be answered. You're just going to get up here, honey, and you're just going to preach. You're not even going to look at your notes, you know. <laughs> well, I think that you're the preacher that decided that in preparation for his sermon on lying the following week, that the entire congregation was going to read Mark chapter 17. And so the following week, the preacher asked the congregation, who read Mark chapter 17? And everybody's hand in the congregation flew up. And of course, the preacher just smiled and said, there's only 16 chapters in Mark now I will continue with my sermon on lying. All of you too, right? Nobody said, no, there's only 16 chapters. Okay, just one last one. One last one. Just about the little boy who was walking with his grandma, little Philip. He was spending the weekend with his grandmother. And after a particularly trying week at preschool, his grandmother decided to take him to the park on Saturday morning. It had been snowing all night and everything was just beautiful. And his grandmother commented, doesn't it look like an artist painted the scenery? Do you know, she said to her little grandson, that God painted it just for you? Yes, replied Philip. God did it, and he did it with his left hand. His grandmother looked at him in a confused way and said to him, what makes you say that God did this with his left hand? Well, said Philip, we learned in Sunday school last week that Jesus sits on God's right hand. Go. <laughs> Only Gabby. <laughs> Only Gabby. Good morning. <coughs> Good morning, everybody. How are we all doing? Two things. At the end of this uh, message, we're going to have communion. So if you're online somewhere around the world, get your communion ready. And you can participate with us. I do appreciate those who are tuning in from other countries, uh, whether it's South Africa or Germany or even Saudi Arabia. So we just appreciate each one of them who've come online and just encourage you uh, to be part of the service today. 
We also want to say to you, if you are in other countries and you would like to be part of uh, Rooted, you can do so. Um, all you need to do is let me know, and you can uh, dial in or you can just click on that Zoom link from our web page and you can join uh, what we're doing on a Sunday morning or a uh, Wednesday evening. So we would appreciate that. And then also afterwards, we started it last week. We want to do this on an ongoing basis. And we understand that some people have to leave. We understand that you might have other things on your plate after the service, but if you would like, you can just stay where you are and we will continue to worship just a little bit. And we will go around, Gabby and I and uh, some of the other leaders in the church will go around and they'll pray for you wherever you are, whatever the reason you might be, have. And so I encourage you to do that because it's, you know, it's so easy just to bolt out of the back door and off we go and we just immerse ourselves in the lives that we have and that's not wrong in and of itself. But why don't we just take a little time at the end of the service just to reflect on what's been said and allow the Lord to minister to our hearts. Amen? Amen? Good. So let me quickly recap what we said last week. Uh, because I believe these teachings are so important. I believe there's a, a great deal of misconception about the Holy Spirit. I also believe that the things as that relate to the Holy Spirit have been siloed. We talk about Acts chapter 2 when the Holy Spirit came. And then we'll go to Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12. We'll talk about the gifts of the Spirit. And then we'll go to uh, Galatians chapter 5 where we talk about the fruit of the Spirit. I want us to begin to understand that the gift of the Holy Spirit that was given in Acts chapter 2 is linked to Romans chapter 12, is linked to 1 Corinthians 12, is linked to Galatians chapter 5. That because you and I have been filled with the Holy Spirit, God has imparted gifts to us, leadership, and all the other gifts that there are in 1, in 1 Corinthians 12 and Romans chapter 12, and also as our minds get changed, as our minds get renewed by the Spirit of God, we begin to manifest the fruit of the Spirit. But it all starts with you and I receiving the gift of the Spirit, just like the disciples did on the day of Pentecost. All right? And so we know that church participation has been declining in the United States over the past five decades. In fact, hundreds of churches close every month. It's estimated, and this is the last uh, figures that we have, that in 2019, over 4,500 churches closed in the United States. Now, added to that, there are pastors, many, many, many pastors, who have given up with the ministry, who last year just left the ministry because of the pressures and etc., I know in our own uh, group denomination, just in this area, over 130 pastors have left the ministry as a result of what's been happening. Now, that sounds like it's a crisis, doesn't it? Closings are increasing at an unprecedented rate because the percentage of young people are choosing to do uh, other things. In fact, last year, 54% of millennials decided that church wasn't relevant any longer. We talk about Christians. And I could go on and give you uh, statistic after statistic. But not only is everything around us changing at an unprecedented rate, but also Christianity is rapidly changing. So how do we understand these changes in faith? And what will the impact of a global connectedness have on the church? And I want to say there is a global connectedness because we have people from various countries around the world. We have people from other states joining us every Sunday morning. And I do appreciate that, that we get an opportunity to fellowship with them even if it's not in person. 
So when thinking about the global church, it's impossible also to ignore the, the presence of other religions. And people are exploring all these other religions, and we know that essentially they are all false. People are looking for spiritual insights, and as a result, they, they're looking for other forms of religion besides Christianity. And then we just look at the church itself. Uh, the church missiologist, Ed Stetzer, said the two biggest challenges in the church are nominalism and secularism. Nominalism is, well, I'm a Christian and I can do what I want to. Secularism is where they've migrated from the church into the world and other things have become more important. They have all the lingo. They know exactly when they come into a service, they can hear the words and they can understand the words, but they've become secularized in their, in their, in their walk, in the way that they live. So, does Christianity and church have a future in the 21st century? And to that, some people might ask, isn't Christianity and the church the same thing? And I'd say, I don't believe they're interchangeable, and I'll explain in a moment. The word Christianity, as used today, simply refers to a, a system of faith grounded amongst those who are adherents of Jesus. The church, on the other hand, is a word which refers to people who regard themselves as followers of Christ, who might gather in a building like we do today. And so the question, does Christianity and the church have a future? The answer to both of those is yes, though it is a yes that must be qualified. As far as Christianity is concerned, there's an easy answer for the believers because we only have to go and look at the Gospels. For instance, in Matthew chapter 13, Jesus had a number of parables. He had the parable of the good seed and the bad seed. And then he also spoke about the mustard seed and the yeast and the treasure that was once hidden and now found. And then he talks about a pearl of great value, verse 45 and 46 of Matthew 13, and a net bringing in all kinds of fish. And then in chapter 22 of Matthew, it's the parable of the wedding banquet, where one day you and I will sit down at a banquet in heaven with him. And so according to Jesus, Christianity has a future. And you know, we can hardly begin to articulate all the external, internal corruptive influences that Christianity has survived across the centuries of existence. Over and over there have been kings and there's been rulers that have tried to stamp out Christianity. We can only need to think of some of the, the persecuted nations that that we know of, that where Christianity has been tried to be stamped out, and yet it's grown even in the midst of persecution. In fact, it's grown even stronger. And then Jesus himself made this uh, stupendous claim for his church, which in and of itself is far-reaching, a far-reaching prophecy. Eugene Peterson puts it this way in Matthew 16, 18. This is the rock on which I will put, I will put together my church. A church so expansive with energy that not even the gates of hell will be able to keep it out. That's what God is doing. In the midst of what is happening in our nation, God is putting together a church. I'm not talking about an institution, but I'm talking about a people who are desirous of knowing the fullness of God and His Spirit. Jesus described what? and upon whom the church was built. And there's nothing that can extinguish that light. And so what we need to begin to think about is, I believe that the future of the church is not predetermined. But I knew, do know Jesus has got this. I do know Jesus has got this. God ensures the future, but we under him are called to flesh out the specific forms of his church's future. Last week I quoted from a German theologian who said the following, As a result of Jesus' coming, the Christian community is to be a people of hope. So what I'm talking about this morning is not to, to, for you to, to feel despair and for you to feel that there is no future in the church. We need to be a people of hope. We live in a hopeful expectation of the final consummation of God's rule over the entire world. Therefore, the calling of the church is to remain in the world, for this is where the struggle for truth occurs. Only think about Daniel. 
Think about Daniel, the way he was, where he was. He was in captivity in Babylon, and yet every morning he opened his window and prayed. In the midst of that persecution, he stood firm. And I believe God has endowed us with his spirit so that in these times, you and I can stand firm. We need to be people of hope. That's who we are and what we're called to be. And so I began by asking two questions. Does Christianity in the church have a future in the 21st century? And the simple answer is yes and yes. The Acts of the Apostle is the, record, is the record of the fulfillment of a promise made by Christ to his disciples and the consequences thereof. It is not merely a story of words and deeds of the Apostle after the resurrection and ascension of Christ, but it tells us how they established the church in the world. And that is what we need to go back to. How was the church established? Because that needs to be our blueprint for the future. It is the story of the coming and the results of the coming of the Holy Spirit. And although the title of this book is The Acts of the Apostles, it in effect describes the acts of the Holy Spirit through mere mortals. It is a revelation of the Holy Spirit governing and guiding and controlling and directing men in the acts that we, or the, the things that they did that is recorded in this book. It is the beginning of the church. The people uh, Luke writes about were people that were fallible. They were like you and me, you know. They were fallible to errors and passions of humanity. And that's clear enough in there. But what is clearly evident is that they were recipients of the Holy Spirit sent upon them by Christ. And all that they did was due to the influence of the Holy Spirit. They recognized what happened to them they were obedient to the Holy Spirit, and then they lived and worked and did the exploits of the Holy Spirit. So this book is more than an account of people. We think of their growth in learning and experience. We think of them as actuated by common motives of zeal and devotion. And then we imagine some, such a common natural motive sufficiently strong enough to produce the effects you have spoken about. And so what happens when we think of it in that way, any revelation of the Holy Spirit is obscured or lost. But think with me, that emphasis is all wrong. The Holy Spirit is given first. The Holy Spirit was given first. And then all the acts are, that we read about in the book of Acts is a consequence of men and women who bowed their knee to Christ, received the fullness of the Spirit, and then began to live in that fullness. If we read it this way, then we see the results which follow the giving of the Holy Spirit already possessed with these instincts. You see, the Holy Spirit comes upon them. The Holy Spirit has all these gifts that we read about in Corinthians and Romans. The Holy Spirit has all the fruit of the Spirit because it's God manifest. And so God is manifest in you and I for His glory. Now, think about it in this way. The church today has neglected that whole part. And no wonder we're in trouble as a church. And I'm talking about the church universal. No wonder we're not living as God has commanded for us to live because we do not have cognizance of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We see what happens when the Holy Spirit comes on you and I, people with the same failings and shortcomings, and frankly, flesh or earthly manifestation, the Holy Spirit changes it all. So we understand this about the gift of the Spirit. Number one, that it's a definite gift given at a definite time. He, the Holy Spirit, is a definite gift received at a definite time, but it's only for Christians. Number two, it was not an experience of a vague influence that they kind of felt every now and again, you know. You get people coming to church and they say, ooh, you're the Holy Spirit's here. He's always here. 
He's always here. It's just, are our ears open? Are we listening to Him? Are we hearing Him speak to us? I, I was blessed with what Kelly came up with this morning. Kelly came because she felt that God was speaking through her for this congregation. You know what? When you're out there in the job, when you might be there with your friends or family, you can listen for his voice. And he will speak to you. You see, there's another way of living beyond what we are living today, even in the church. That's why Paul asked the believers at Ephesus, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? He expected Christians to know the Holy Spirit, to know whether they had received Him, and to know when they had received Him. The third thing, the spirituality links the works, the apostles, with the works of Jesus. The spirituality, the Holy Spirit comes, links the works of Jesus with the Holy Spirit, with the apostles, and with you and I. In other words, the description of the work of the apostles in the book of Acts is the description of the ongoing work of Jesus. And you and I, isn't it marvelous that he has chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise? These apostles were not very educated, and I'll get to that in a moment. We are called to carry on the work of Christ here on earth in the same power and authority as he did. He tells us in John 14 from verse 12, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And then he goes on. And he says, and greater works than these will he do because I am going to the Father. Aren't you tired? I am. Aren't you tired of just living this mundane, kind of normal life when there is another dimension of God, another dimension of your Christianity, another dimension of who God is that He wants us to tap into? Can you see how short the church is falling in carrying out the ministry of Christ in the world? Large sections of the church today disregard, ignore, or merely pay lip service to the Holy Spirit. And so today we have church, a church, the church, using management principles and personalities to try and attract the world. But they, they're using the same things the world uses and there's no power in it. I tell you what attracts people. It is the power of the living God manifest in their lives and manifest in the church. You only have to look at story after story. You only have to look at the, what is happening in the world today, especially in the East and in the South, Africa especially, and also Latin America. There is an outpouring of the Spirit of God like they have never seen. And people are coming to Christ in their droves. Why? Simply because of the Holy Spirit. Not a management principle, not a personality, but Jesus and Jesus only. Now, don't you hunger for that? Don't you long for that? I do. I long for the day when I wouldn't even have to get up here. I could take my notes and I could make paper airplanes and I could just throw them out there. And we just spend time in the presence of God. And we know He's here. We know that that's what He wants to do in and through us. But are we willing to pay the price? So the work of the apostles with which this book is concerned acts is linked with the work of Jesus Christ as the carrying on of that which he began on earth under the impulse and the direction of the Spirit of God. 
Romans chapter 8 and 11. Let me just find it. I just thought of it now. If, Romans 8, 11. If the spirit of him who raised Christ Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies. The Spirit of God that raised Christ Jesus from the dead dwells in you. Think about that. Think about what that means. That on the third day he rose again by the Spirit of the living God and that same Spirit dwells in you today. That same spirit that directed Jesus now directs and leads the apostles and he will do likewise. John 14, 7. But you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. He's talking about now and he's talking about the future. Pentecost had not yet occurred when the church had, and the church had not begun when Jesus spoke those words. But you know him. We know him. And he says, for he dwells in you and he will be with you. The giving of the Holy Spirit is directly connected with Jesus being glorified. It could and can only be received by those who believe in Jesus. And it was and will continue to remain unknown to those outside the church. Only Christians have the privilege of this gift. Because it is Christ's gift to the believer. Let me take a moment and talk about righteousness. Within every single one of us, there is something, unless our conscience has been seared, but there's something that tells us what is right and what is wrong. We call that our conscience. Conscience may approve or disapprove an action, but the question we need to answer is this. Does our conscience inspire, guide, lead us to communion with God or even fill us with the desire for the salvation of other people? No. And so while we know and understand that all of mankind is created in the image of God, we must not confuse the spirit which indwells Jesus with the spirit that say that, that life breath that was breathed into all of creation. It is a different thing. All of creation, whether it was Confucius or Buddha or anybody, they all have that life-giving spirit breathed into them because we created in His image. But, have I confounded you all with what I just said? But think about it. Everybody who walks down that road, drives down that road, has God's life-giving Spirit in them. But they do not have the Holy Spirit until they acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Amen? A person who doesn't know Christ walks in this door. They have the life-giving Spirit of God in them. But they do not have the Holy Spirit until they become Christians. Amen? And so, because the Holy Spirit revealed in Jesus Christ is the same Spirit we need to live like our Savior and be a blessing to the world. When the Spirit came on the day of Pentecost... It says a little bit further on in Acts chapter 4, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind which we must be saved. Now, the occasion was Peter and John were before the Sanhedrin. And the Sanhedrin was questioning them about what happened to this guy at the gate beautiful. Remember? 
They were walking past, and this guy was asking for alms, and they turned around and said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I, ye, give I thee. Arise and walk in the name of Jesus. This guy had been at that gate for years and years and years, and here comes two people, normal people like you and I, infused and filled with the Holy Spirit, and they hear the Holy Spirit speaking to them. And they stop. And they say, I don't have anything to give you. But what I do have, what I have, is Jesus. Get up and walk. And so because of that, these guys are all before the Sanhedrin. And here's what it says, and I'll explain that in a moment. And they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Yeah, these learned guys, these guys who'd studied scriptures all their lives, they recognized that there was something different about these two guys. They had been with Jesus. It was because of Jesus that they'd been given the gift. It was because of the gift of the Holy Spirit that the man at Gate Beautiful was healed. He could only dwell those who knew now and know Jesus as Lord. To receive the Spirit was to receive Jesus, to have Jesus in dwelling. So, Pentecost was a new gift. To a person like Cornelius. Because in Acts 19.2, Paul says to him, Have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? How many people who sit in the churches week after week after week have not received the Holy Spirit since they believed? It is so vital for you and I. If we're going to see a regeneration, a revitalization of the church, we need to understand the Holy Spirit and what He can do in plain, ordinary people, educated or uneducated. Amen. You don't have to get a doctor of ministries to know the Holy Spirit and to move in the, in the fullness of that which He has for you. Amen. You don't have to be like the Sanhedrin. You can just be like Peter and John. Silver and gold have I not. Such as I have given you. And so, the accounts given in these chapters, in the book of Acts, and I encourage you, go and read this. Go and read it from a different perspective. Don't read it from, okay, these guys are now filled with the Holy Spirit and they do all of this. Go and read it from the perspective and the understanding that before the Holy Spirit, they were nothing. But it was when they were filled with the power of God, they became different people. Now, let me ask you this. Have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? You see, what we read in the book of Acts is essentially the account of the reception of a gift. A new gift. The realization of its meaning and power followed afterwards. In reality, they experienced the event first. And then they saw the fulfillment. Then they saw, once they'd received it, Paul talks about it in Romans and, and Corinthians. He talks about what happened through them. When the gifts of the Spirit were manifest. Amongst them the gift of healings. That's what that guy had at Gate Beautiful. Healings and miracles. Amen. Let me take a slight diversion. When they stood before the members of the council, it says in Scripture in, in Acts chapter 4. They were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John. For they could see that they were ordinary men with no special training in Scripture. 
They also recognized them in men who had been with Jesus. Do people know that we've been with Jesus? Hmm. It was after the Holy Spirit was given that they were changed and emboldened. So what was the council that they're talking about? Well, it was the Sanhedrin Council of Jerusalem, which was the highest Jewish authority in Israel before A.D. 70. It was the governing body of the Jewish nation at the time of Christ. The council was the supreme political and religious body in Israel. It's like, he, it's like these two guys going before Congress. And you have the whole of United States Congress is out there questioning what happened. It's the same kind of thing. Okay? Notice what it says. They could see that there were ordinary men with no special training. Let me explain what they were saying. The question became in Jesus' day, at what age do you start teaching the text? Education was huge in Jesus' time. Josephus, the first century Jewish historian, said, Above all, we pride ourselves on the education of our children. Educating the children was central to the life of the community. They understood that if the text did not get into the minds and hearts and souls of a child, if this text does not get into them, then they were one generation away from uh, extinct, extinction. They took great pride in the way they would educate a child. Notice from an ancient source it says this. The world subsists through the breath of school children. Now, I'm going to take a diversion and then I go back to my other diversion. What is happening in our schools today? They recognize that if they can put a particular ideology in the lives of little people today, it'll change a society down in the future. Can you say amen? amen. Maybe you can say oh my. Because that's the truth. If they can get an ideology into the schools today and teach these little people, then they have them forever. Now, The Talmud says this, under the age of six, would you not receive a child as a pupil? But from six upwards, accept him and stuff him with the Torah like an ox. There are three stages. So in other words, put the word of God in them. That's the whole purpose of children's church downstairs. That's the whole purpose of the youth. Train up a child in the way that they should go. And when they get old, they will not depart from it. There are three stages. Quickly, I want to take you through that. The first stage of education is called Beit Sifa, which means house of the book. Sifa, the house of the book. You begin with Beit Sifa somewhere around the age of six. We're taught in local synagogues. So in the village of Capernaum or Tyre or Sidon, you'd have a synagogue. There'd be a local rabbi, and the kids at six would begin school, and they would begin to memorize the Torah. And by the age of 10, they would have memorized Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Can you imagine that? Take your Bible when you go home this afternoon, and look at those books, the first five books of the Bible. They would know them by the age of 10 by heart. The next stage would be the age 10 to 14. And that was called Beit Talmud. And they, the more advanced students would keep going. So there was a cutoff place when they were at age 10. And I explained that. In Beit Talmud, they would memorize the rest of the Hebrew Scriptures. All the whole of the Old Testament, they would memorize. And then, Genesis all the way to Malachi, the whole deal. By the age of 13 or 14, the entire Hebrew scriptures were memorized. And you would learn the art of Jewish questions and answers. 
In the Western educational system, it's very rational and oriented around transmission of information. We would teach a child, what is two plus two? And the child would say four. In Jewish culture, it was very different. They were much more interactive, and there was far much more processing go on, going on. And so they would ask a child, what is two plus two? A student might come back and answer, what is 16 divided by four? For those non-mathematicians, it's the same answer for four. That's why, I, that was a joke, by the way. <laughs> That's why often when Jesus was asked a question, well, how did he respond? He responded with a question. They wanted this child to be the kind of child that could interact with scriptures and not just sprout things back. And at the end of Beit Talmud, there was one more step. And so if you were the best of the best and you'd made it through Beit Talmud, there was a third stage of education called Beit Midrash. Beit Midrash generally started at the age of 14 and the best of the best would be tutored by a rabbi. I don't have time to go on with this, but I'm thinking when they were standing before the council, the Sanhedrin council, they looked at these guys and they knew they were unlearned. Maybe these guys at the age of 10, they didn't cut it. Maybe they weren't able to memorize the first five books and they were cut. And what happened with them then is they used to go and work. Maybe we don't know this, but Peter and John and Andrew and them, they went fishing. Maybe their fathers had fishing boats and that's what they went to do. But, but the gift of the Holy Spirit made a difference. Peter and John could not have done what they did or spoken how they spoke without the power of the Holy Spirit. When the apostles speak with certainty, they spoke with that authority because they had the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so, what are we obliged to do with all of this? Number two. One, I want to challenge you to live your life in a different way. To recognize that the spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead indwells you now. Okay? Read Acts as one who believes in the gift of the Holy Spirit. Number two, we will learn of the spirit in studying his words and deeds was a direct result of, of his coming into their hearts. And number three, and this is most important, it is my firm conviction that in this hour, in this time of testing, for our nation and for us as believers, we need not only to have a baptism of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Amen. but we need to have a hope. Because he has promised he will never leave us nor forsake us. Amen. Don't despair in what's going on out there in the world. Because we have Jesus. And also, we need a baptism of courage. So many Christians have shrunk back in this day and age. COVID has caused so many Christians to shrink back. We need to be bold, bold for Christ because I tell you what, people are looking for the answers. And the answers is not found in anything that they want to do out there. The answer is found only in Jesus. Let us stand for righteousness and demand integrity in our government, in our schools, in our communities. And let me ask you this. Are we just going to sit back and allow our nation to be, uh, to be remade into something that we do, do not recognize? Are we just going to sit back and let the church be marginalized? Throughout the, the Bible, we are told to be salt and light and leaven. All three which affect the environment they are placed into. So it is 
So we have been given the responsibility of fervent prayer, greater courage, so that God's solution may be seen in the world. I am believing for an outpouring of His Spirit in this church like we have never seen before. I'm believing God that people are going to be standing out there waiting for the doors to open. Why? Because we have the Holy Spirit. You have the Holy Spirit. Would you believe with me? Would you believe with me? Would you pray with me? Because you see, God has the answer. God's got this, folks. God's got this. And what's happening out there in the world is not taken him by surprise. Amen. Amen. Did we learn something this morning? Yes. Hallelujah. You all have communion. And those of you online, I hope you found something to take communion with. It doesn't have to be these things that we have here in this church. It could be, uh, I don't know, a Doritos and a, a piece of bread. Anything. If you don't have any grape juice, it could be water. Doesn't matter. It's not what this is, but it what it stands for. Amen. And so we, we take communion with those around the world and in various states that are have joined us this morning. We're empowered by his Holy Spirit. And it says in 1 Corinthians eleven, for I received from the Lord that which I delivered to you. That the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. I've said this before. These little wafer thingies are just too perfect. So I want you to break it. Because then it becomes jagged and... And it looks like it can't be put together, but I, I read about Jesus at the cross at Calvary, where his body was so broken and so marred. That reminds me when I can do this with the wafer of the price that Jesus paid so that I might have a relationship with him. And then let's just take. And likewise, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as oft as you drink in remembrance of me. Father, we thank you for your broken body and your shed blood. We thank you it is through the shed blood we have remission of our sins. It is through your blood that we can come into your throne room boldly and make our petitions known. And so, Lord, we come today. If anybody has any needs, anybody has any challenges in your life today, take this cup and say, Lord, you know what I need. In Jesus' name we pray.